Will you pray with me? Oh, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Oh, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is a story about salt. Now, first I am going to tell you a story where I am going to sound very stupid. <laughs> so before I do that, I just want you to hear a couple of other things to counterbalance what you are about to hear. I have successfully completed 10 years of post-secondary education. I did almost, but not quite as well as my big sister on the SATs. <laughs> and most of the time, I can keep up with Larry Bowers who is simultaneously kind-hearted and a genius. And that, more than any other qualification, is truly saying something. Y'all ready? Here it comes. Up until 10 days ago, I believed that fossil fuels came from dinosaurs. <laughs> At some point, my brain decided that fossil fuel meant fossils, and fossils mean dinosaurs, and I never had any cause to question it. And so I just went about my life being totally wrong about how oil comes into being. Just filling up my car with lies. Thinking that fossil fuels come from dinosaurs is entirely wrong. They come mostly from plants, from time, from pressure, and an environment with no oxygen. But it, a thing about being entirely wrong about where fossil fuels come from is that it's the kind of primary conviction that leads to entirely wrong-headed secondary convictions. <laughs> like believing that when the comet came, all of the dinosaurs across the world somehow knew that it was time to have a giant cuddle puddle in Texas and Alberta and Saudi Arabia. <laughs> and believing that the reason that fossil fuels are a non-renewable resource is about the rate at which we're using the fuel, but is mostly about the total lack of dinosaurs on Earth right now that we cannot use to make more oil. I made a whole series of stories, a whole way of engineers over here being like, I did almost as well as my big sister on the SATs. <laughs> I made a whole series of stories, a whole way of making meaning up in my head that was just wrong. It was founded on an understandable but totally wrong belief. And then it just settled into my brain, and I didn't question it at all. Until a kind person who will remain anonymous but is sitting in the row over here explained to me what the truth was. But this is a story about salt. It's very easy to be very smart and very wrong, to be salt that's lost its saltiness. John Winthrop was. John Winthrop was the second, sixth, ninth, and twelfth governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and he was very smart and very wrong. He graduated from Cambridge at 18. He was the only son of five children, and so by the standards of the time, he set the standard for his family's SAT scores. And he was wildly wrong about the land we now call Massachusetts and the people who live there. Wildly wrong. He had heard some things, picked up some stories, connected some metaphors, and strung together a way of making sense of the world that was just wrong. One of the many places where we really hear how wrong he was, how much his salt had lost its saltiness is in a sermon he gave in 1630. It's the one he gave on board the ship Arbella, the one where he talks about Boston being a city on a hill. It's pretty famous. Americans no less impressive than JFK have picked up its metaphors and extended them to all of these United States, calling Boston and Massachusetts and our whole country beacon lights for other nations. Parts of the original sermon go like for we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. Beloved, we are commanded this day to love the Lord our God and to love one another, to walk in his ways and keep his commandments, that we may live and be multiplied in the land whither we go. If our hearts turn away and we worship other gods, we shall surely perish out of the good land whither we pass over this vast sea to possess. You can hear it, right? The salt, 
the echoes of scripture, the stories and the threads that he's pulling together to make meaning. There are echoes of Micah and Matthew. I think a hint of Noah's story in Genesis when God puts together a group of faithful people and puts them on a boat. But mostly, mostly there's a thread from Deuteronomy chapter 30. He names it. He knows what he's doing. I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways and observing his commandments, you shall live and become numerous. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering. But if your heart turns away and you bow down to other gods, you shall certainly perish and not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. These are the words of the covenant of the Lord that the Lord commanded Moses to make with the Israelites in the land of Moab after 40 years in the wilderness, right before the Jordan right before they crossed into the land that God had sworn to give their ancestors. Land full of nations God promises to destroy so that the Israelites might take the land and dwell in it themselves. It's so easy to be very smart and very wrong, to be salt without its saltiness. To sit in a boat and tell a story about people, about a call from God to be a city on a hill. And to trace your text and tell a tale that says the shores you'll land on are both yours to fill and the fulfillment of a promise from God. To tell a story that makes your people the chosen people and makes it not just okay but God ordained that you destroy the people that you meet and call it holy work. We shall be as a city upon a hill, where the eyes of all the people are upon us. Winthrop took our passage today and used it to tell a story of domination, to justify a course of domination. John Winthrop, who was anti-democracy and pro-oligarchy, of course believed that there are people and then there are people. And so he had no problem categorically denying the people he met on the shores of Massachusetts Bay, the Nipmuc and the Patuxet and the Wampanoag, because he was already used to dehumanizing the people around him. For Winthrop, lands and titles and whiteness and maleness and Protestantism were things that made one human more human than another. And he took the things he believed that were so very wrong. And these stories he knew from the Bible and lifted out some metaphors and strung them all together and read it back on to Jesus and said his will, Winthrop's will, was both good and the will of God. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Murder, dispossession, power grabbing, the dehumanization of your neighbor to the point of death. However persuasive Winthrop's rhetoric, I don't think these are the ways of Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't say you are the light of the does say you are the light of the world, but he doesn't say kill your neighbor. Jesus says things like, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. When Jesus teaches the crowds, We're still in the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus tells the people listening to him that they are the light of the world and that light is not to be hid, that looks more like sharing power, making peace, and showing mercy. The light, the light that ought to shine from those who listen to and believe in Jesus should be light which rehumanizes, not dehumanizes. 
dehumanizes. Light which shines to reveal and affirm the full humanity, dignity, and inherent worth of each person, sweeping away rather than enhancing the shadows which might deny or mask that reality. A city on a hill should not be a place of might, but of spirit and mercy and peace. But it's so very easy to be very smart and very wrong. We do it. As a people, as a nation, as a city, as a church. It's so possible for us to set ourselves up as a city on a hill, as God's chosen people, and trace our texts from JFK to John Winthrop and back to the Bible, and string together a whole way of making sense of God and the world that just isn't true and takes Christianity out at the knees. Salt without its saltiness, the stories without the heart underneath them. Power would have us do that. Stack lands and titles and whiteness and maleness and Protestantism on top of each other and tell a story about worth and the kingdom of God where somehow accidentally the powerful people are also the holiest. The powerful people are the best and the most beloved. It's so easy. It's the natural consequence, the secondary conviction that drips out of a very wrong primary conviction, that one kind of human is more human than another. And when you say it out loud, it sounds almost as crazy as me believing that we could solve the fossil fuel crisis with Jurassic Park. <laughs> but more often than not, it's how we live. Salt without its saltiness. Stories without the heart underneath them. What can salt do to restore its taste? To get its saltiness back? I have good news for you. You can't actually lose it. Salt can't lose its saltiness. It wouldn't be salt anymore. And you, you can't lose your belovedness or the ways in which you were made in the image of God any more than an atom of sodium and an atom of chloride can be anything other than salt. What you can do is dilute it, mix it in with other things like the lemon juice of evaluating intelligence with the list of qualifications or like the vinegar of white supremacy culture. The stories we soak our lives in matter, from dinosaurs on down. It matters what we believe, and it matters when we're wrong. We could put the vinegar down, but we can't pretend that it was never there. We've got work to do if we want to live into what it means to be the salt of the earth. May God grant us the grace and the time to do it. <laughs>